Oh, Scott, can you stop screen sharing for a minute? Yes. So I can get my script up here. There it is. Okay, you can start again. We are live. Wait, how do I get over to the... Oh, there it is. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Jeffrey Hogreef, the co-editor with Scott Russ of In Search of African American Space, Redressing Racism. And I'm also a professor of humanities and media studies and founder of the architecture writing program at Pratt Institute. Welcome. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to ask for a land acknowledgement for the Lenape people who are forcibly removed from what is now Brooklyn and who have lost any US legal recourse to recover their land compelling their descendants to reside in a placeless state of exile. Reparations for this genocide are impossible to calculate at this time, but the moment we take for a land acknowledgement is, I think, especially fitting tonight. In the case of Brooklyn, this meant that the land where the Lenape people had been forcibly removed from and cast out to the hinterland was colonized by settlers with enslaved people who were forcibly removed from Africa, resulting in, by my thinking, a layered red and black genocide that seems even more difficult to calculate. What are we to do with this memory? How are we to assume responsibility for the privilege that Pratt Institute affords us as students and faculty members to gather in a place that is haunted like this? As an Oglala Lakota Sundance person, I offer Mitakie Oasin a Lakota affirmation of the interconnectedness and mutual interdependency of creation. We are all related. Tonight's talk, Embodied Silences, Meditations on Maps, Museums, and Monuments by J. Yolanda Daniels, is the second of three talks inspired by the publication of the anthology In Search of African American Space, Redressing Racism. On March 4th, Rodney Leon will present Diasporic Monuments and the Translation of Context in Conversation with Scott Ruff, his research in African American space, which led to the design of the African Burial Ground and the Ark of the Return of the UN at the UN. All of the talks are hosted by the School of Architecture, Department of Humanities and Media Studies, and Graduate Program in Performance and Performance Studies at Pratt Institute. I'd like to especially thank Dean Harriet Harris, Dean Helio Takai, Suzanne Verderber, Meredith Tenher, Frederica Vanucci, Jennifer Miller, and a special thanks to Carrie Edwards, Ashley Simone, Barbara Miglete, and Lars Mueller for creating a book for us to celebrate tonight that is as magnificent to hold as it is to read. Ashley is here tonight on the Zoom dais to introduce tonight's speaker, J. Yolanda Daniels, in Search of African American Space, Redressing Racism is a recipient of a publication grant from the Graham Foundation for the Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts. We elected to host tonight's talk, which presents Yolanda's personal explorations as an architect in search of African American space. Since it, like the first event, highlights the co-constitutive relationship of performance and architecture that is a central theme of the anthology. Compiling essays from contemporary architects, historians, and artists to excavate the personal and historic memory of the African diaspora. Each author engages in space making as a way of undoing racism. Space is considered as a dynamic force in cultural formations, both in terms of architecture or design form and performance or everyday practices in real time, as well as how these elements come together and overlap as we'll hear a, a discussion of tonight. 
For the most part, American architecture has served to regulate, survey, punish, and exterminate the Black person, which is why the experience of space has remained outside the study and practice of the discipline until very recently. This is remarkable considering that slavery, a key material practice in the European colonization of the Western Hemisphere, was designed and carried out in the carceral spaces of the slave ship, the slave plantation cabin, and the urban slum ghetto. Slavery was designed and its structures are still inculcated in the design of architecture. African Americans have fashioned other uses and meanings from these typologies by appropriating spaces of resistance through the work of making space out of no space, as James Baldwin writes in Sunny Blues. Tonight's talk exemplifies the ways in which the search for African American space is a creative and aspirational interpretation of space. It is fleeting and formed by cultural dynamics that are reproduced in real time and subject to erasure as, as, as it's being made. It is articulated through speech that is performed, its contours linger in memory or are marked negatively by fractured space. Paradoxically, the direct experience of architecture was significantly greater during the period when slave people designed and built the structures of slavery in the Americas. Recent architectural scholarship has privileged the role that black people played in constructing these symptoms, those systems and in the later development of modern architecture. While acknowledging these important historical studies in search of African-American space redressing racism, instead focuses on the spaces of refuge and delight that have been appropriated in the afterlife of slavery, which Saidiya Hartman characterizes as the still unfolding narrative of captivity, dispossession, and domination that engenders the Black subject in the Americas. We are planning more events for next year with other contributors and still others as we expand the potential of African-American space as a transdisciplinary world-shaping and world-making research initiative that was generated outside of the official curriculum as Black Lives Matter emerged on the campus and is now housed at Pratt Institute in the development of new curriculum, pedagogy, and community development. Pratt, as those of you who have visited the campus will know, is located in one of the leading historic African-American neighborhoods in the US. Each contributor to the anthology has added to our understandings of the ways in which African-American space is enacted through appropriation for purposes of refuge and delight across multiple disciplines that interplay with architecture. The anthology is organized thematically to present African-American space in a broad cultural context across media and representation and incorporating advancements in the study of the uncanny and practice of intersectionality, as we will hear tonight. In the foreword, Tina Kemp addresses practices of refusal and celebration. In part one, politics without a proper locus, historians Ann Holder and Radhikani Clytus contextualize the development of space in everyday practices. As those of you who are here for the first lecture heard, architect Scott Ruff presents an examination of the fraught relationship between the plantation and museum in memorializing African-American space. The second part, materializing memory, provides a glimpse of the practices of architects Rodney Leon, Elizabeth Kennedy, Sarah Caples, and Everardo Jefferson. For these architects, typologies of the African diaspora are significant in grasping with the complex task of memorialization. As you will hear more about tonight, architect and artist Yolanda Daniels introduces the final section, recording erasure, bridging the spatial practices of memorialization and artistic practices. Artists Wallace Johnson and Marisa Williamson uh, as you heard in the last lecture from Marisa, engage social and political narratives in performance and installation. I will now introduce Ashley Simone, Simone who will introduce the speakers. Um, Ashley Simone is an editor, writer, photographer, and educator who is the founder of Editrix, a curatorial and editorial consultancy specializing in art and architecture. In addition to In Search of African American Space, Redressing Racism, she is the editor of many books, including A Genealogy of Modern Architecture and The Other Modern Movement by Kenneth Frampton, Two Journeys by Michael Webb, and Occupation, Boundary, Art, Architecture, and Culture at the Water about the work of Kathy Simon. 
Ashley is a visiting assistant professor of architecture at Pratt Institute, where Scott and I met her and began to collaborate on the publication of In Search of African American Space, which emerged from a 2016 symposium of the same title. As production editor, together with Carrie Edwards and Barbara Miglete, she managed a complex book of 100 color plates with 10 contributors from four different disciplines. She set a rigorous editorial style for us to arrive at a didactic relationship between image and text for a volume with depth and weight. Thank you very much, Ashley. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Jeffrey, for the very generous introduction. Um, you know, thank you, Scott, uh, for all your work um, or having me work with you on this project. Um, and you know, I again I echo the thanks that Jeffrey already um, issued to you know Dean Harriet Harris for her support, um, as well as uh, another co-editor, Carrie Eastman and uh, Barbara Magletti. Uh, who, who served as an assistant on this project. Um, and tonight I, I would like to welcome our speakers. Um, I will first introduce uh, Yolanda and then Toby. Um, Yolanda Daniels is a co-founding principal of the architecture and design practice studio Sumo based in New York and in Los Angeles where she is a, an assistant professor in architecture at the University of Southern California. Her firm, Studio Sumo, has been recognized for design excellence by the Venice Biennale, the National Design Councils of Japan and Germany, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Architectural League of New York, Design Vanguard, the New York State Council on the Arts, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the American Institute of Architects. Yolanda received her undergraduate degree in architecture from City College and her master's from Columbia University. She has taught at institutions that include Columbia University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Yale University. Her research, which has been exhibited and published widely, explores the spatial effects and techniques of power and narrative in architecture and urban space, and has been supported by fellowships, including the Rome Prize and the Independent Study Program of the Whitney Museum of American Art. Her design research project, Black City, the Los Angeles edition will be exhibited in Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America, an exhibition curated by Sean Anderson that opens this week at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Joining the conversation tonight as an interlocutor is Toby Ajayi, who is a student at Princeton University where she studies architecture and visual arts. Originally from Nigeria, Toby's research interests are located in spatial practices that explore black cultural identity and more specifically, the work of women of the African diaspora. Currently, she is writing on the architecture of Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust. In September, Toby wrote a review of In Search of African American, In Search of African American Space for Pinup Magazine in which she celebrated the volume for the expansive notions of space that it puts forward and highlights the contribution by our speaker tonight, Yolanda Daniels. Yolanda Daniels essay titled Embodied Silences, Three Meditations on Maps, Museums and Monuments draws on suppressed social and spatial narratives highlighting architecture as a medium for both speculative and commemorative forms of social advocacy. Uh, welcome. Yolanda and um, welcome Toby. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Um, so thank you also for your, um, your um, assistance as editor and um, to Scott and Jeffrey, thank you so much for um, including me in this um, anthology. Um, it was really, it, it was a while ago that there was the actual um, symposium that that kind of, at least for me, started it all. Um, and it's really great to see how it's evolved um, and become this really wonderful um, 
anthology that is a resource, I think, for um, everyone moving forward. So I will share my screen now. I think you can see my screen. Okay, so um, yeah, we're here to celebrate the book and my contribution um, embodied silences, three meditations on maps, museums and monuments is, is a combination of four things. One is it shows uh, three projects um, and then it also summarizes an essay that I wrote um, about um, the notions of, of silence and repressed histories, repressed, um, uh, repressed narratives, and um, the concept of negative monumentalization. Um, and I start with the project Silent Witness, um, Silent Witness Remnants of Slave Spaces. It's, it's actually cited in Brazil. When I started this project, um, it was a grant from the um, um, New York AIA, a travel grant. And I, I started with wanting to look at slave spaces in the United States. This was in 1995. Um, and, um, and of course I thought of plantations, but then I, I went to Brazil and, and actually in Brazil, what was really interesting was that there were museums where you could go where the history had been preserved where you could actually go and study like relics of slavery. And so that's how I, I kind of navigated toward um, this project. Um, so what I'm showing you here is an installation um, that came after the essay where the images um, are projected into a corner. So it's like two projectors shooting images into a corner to get at the kind of um, subjective feeling um, of experiencing um, this uh, monument slash negative monument. And it's in Casa dos Cantos in um, Minas Gerais in Oro Preto in Brazil. It's a um, like a very fine building. Um, that's a, a general tourist attraction, a national monument. And what was really interesting to me was how the slave spaces in this building um, existed, but they weren't uh, drawn in the official plan. So when you get a booklet of um, the um, monument, um, you know, it has the plans of all the floors and then there's just this kind of um, negative space or undrawn space for where the slave quarters are, just blank. Um, and to find this space, you basically walk through, um, you're walking through the monument past the kitchen um, and kind of past the latrine. There was this very interesting um, latrine with a, like a ledge with a hole in it, with a wood, um, a wood seat on, on top with the hole. And basically um, moving around this latrine down the stairs, um, one would enter into the space. Um, thank you, Yolanda, for um, briefly describing that project. Um, my first question pertains to this concept of negative monumentalization. And in my article, I liken it to Sadia Hartman's theory of critical fabulation in that both methods seek to reveal narratives that have been erased or at the very least overlooked or forgotten. Um, I was wondering if you could firstly speak to how you arrived at this term. Um, and I also mentioned Hartman's theory because he speaks directly to the erased narratives of enslaved black women. And in turn, I'm wondering how negative monumentalization might be applied more specifically to the black female experience, um, especially when we consider the public positioning of black women's bodies of being unworthy of protection and invisible and sometimes hyper visible. Um, yeah. Okay, so I should um, just alert everyone that Toby and I are going to kind of um, 
collaborate back and forth through my presentation in a kind of question and answer as I explain the project. So the idea of negative um, monumentalization, um, it came, it, it's a combination of different theories. Um, one has to do with um, the theory by Raymond LeDoux of um, a kind of syntax of silence, the silence in official monumentalization. So national monuments that um, are monuments of greatness, but that don't, um, that don't exactly explain um, the, the sort of ne negative effects, potential negative effects of that. And so in what I'm showing you here is the plan. So this is the official plan of um, the first floor of Casa dos Cantos. And then just kind of zooming in closer, um, item I and H are, are like where the latrine is and where you sort of move around to go down to a space below A. So the space below A would be where the um, slave quarters are. And so, um, so the idea of, um, of the negative monument, it, it came from um, uh, another theorist also, um, Alois Regal, who wrote about unintentional monuments and um, like the unintentional monument and the involuntary monument and kind of putting together the ideas of silence of official histories and the involuntary unintentional um, is where I, I came up with the term negative monumentalization to describe these spaces that are that exist that have power in their presence but are largely silence in the official narrative so this image is showing uh the latrine and then kind of moving past it into a space that um one would kind of look out to where animals were or um were kept and um, the darkened area is, is the area where the um, people were held. And in the back of this area, as you sort of move further and further back, there's a ledge um, that one could, um, uh, that one could like sort of elevate oneself on, you know, just imagining that you have to walk past a latrine that actually um, is trailing into this area um, that the, the ground wouldn't really be clean and that this ledge is perhaps the one place that you could go where um, it would be clean. Um, what was really interesting to me, um, being like kind of approaching the ledge was, um, I actually couldn't lift myself to get on it. Um, it was, um, you had to be very strong to get, it had like a kind of foothold, but you had to be very strong to even get up to this place. So I think like in terms of, of like critical fabulation and um, I, I think what I'm doing, which is different is I, I think Sadia's Hart Hartman's project is really looking at um, narrative. It's, it's um, she's not an architect and as an architect, I'm really invested in space. So everything that I look at is in terms of, um, you know, how, how, how is this operating in space? What are the effects of power in space? What does this mean in terms of, you know, the spaces that are around us? Um, how can I think of this in terms of something that's constructed um, or something that can be deconstructed as well? Um, and I think that's where the difference is because I'm, I work with narratives, but ultimately the discourse is one about um, space. And I'm, I'm not really, I think I, I sort of um, position the negative monument different from the monuments that are erected, the historical monuments that are erected and um, and it's this question of how, how can you monumentalize these um, less durable artifacts, artifacts that are missing, um, like a kind of silence of artifacts um, without, 
without resorting to the usual tropes of monumentalization. And then I think in terms of like, um, like the question of as an African American woman, how I address this, I think it's a little bit in terms of these projects, I'm looking the three projects in um, in search of African American spaces, space, I'm really looking at race. And I do have other projects where I look at gender and race. And always I when I look at gender, race is always part of it because they're tied to each other. But these projects are actually more about race in the city or race in a particular building or um, even race in the globe. Um, and so I'm not really looking at gender per se in these, although it is one of the subjects that I um, study. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm wondering, cause you mentioned as an architect, like you're interested in like space and when you're confronted with this like absence in the plan, um, I think you mentioned this idea of critical distance in your chapter. Um, so how might you insert like your own observations, like you being there in this space, but um, maintain this like academic objectivity? Um, how do you think critical distance is used within the discipline and how do you give grace to your own spatial experiences um, relative to that need to maintain an objectivity? Yeah, so I I really like the um, the way you worded um, the idea of giving grace to your own experience, and so in the essay, and it's it's um, there's a segment in um, my contribution where um, it's it's kind of like a, a poem. Um, and that's very much about my experience of the space. So when I studied the space, I, I did like, um, I produced like two tracks of, um, of my own artifacts. You know, there's like the essay, which is um, studied and, you know, researched and I've read theorists and kind of came up with these ideas about um, space and monuments and, um, and theorize basically the type of space. But then at the same point, and I write about this in Embodied Silences, there's a point where my, um, my subjectivity, um, where I have to address my subjectivity because uh, the people the people who I'm studying um, are very related to the people that I have descended from. And so um, rather than separate those experiences, I collapse them into the essay. So it's a theoretical essay, but then it's interrupted by this kind of stream of consciousness, um, you know, experience of walking through the space, walking past the latrine, getting into the slave um, quarters and then not being able to lift myself up on the ledge. Um, and so just by doing that, I am breaking the rule of critical distance in, you know, like a theoretical um, approach or a theoretical work. And, and, and I think just the very notion of critical distance is something that um, like has to be um, considered more, um, uh, I don't know, more carefully, more thoughtfully, because it in itself erases other experiences. So by, you know, with critical distance, we're, we're actually like um, pushing away the subjective, but, you know, as was, was kind of explored in feminism um, and in African American studies, like by, um, erasing the subjectivity of certain subjects, um, you know, their histories are also relate, erased in the, in the process. And so I think this idea of, of um, Sadia Hartman's work with critical fabulation is actually, you know, coming up against the idea of critical distance. And my work also in this essay 
Um, and the artifacts that I've made, whether they're the photographic or the textual, are also coming up against the idea of critical distance, but in a productive way to make new strategies, new techniques to move beyond it. So, so for right now, for some reason, my computer is stuck. Has that happened before? Are you using your keyboard to, maybe if you click it? Oh, maybe if I click, okay. Yeah, okay, I'll click now. Um, yeah, so this is uh, one of the artifacts that I made, um, which is basically overwriting um, the text of my experience onto the space, drawing the ledge into the space where it's missing. So it's this kind of liminal space that exists um, alongside the historic and documented you, space. Yolanda, your screen yeah. is stopped sharing. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, let me Go back. share again. Sorry about that. Okay. So I have to get back into... Use your mouse to navigate. Yeah, the mouse kind of got me a little bit into trouble. Um, okay, so cycling out of this liminal space into the next project, which is Intimate Landscapes of the Shotgun House, which was um, an installation at Project Row Houses in Houston, Texas in a shotgun house. Um, this house in particular, this house in particular um, had been gutted, unlike some of the other houses. Um, it was basically whitewashed, gutted. And I basically went and kind of um, through just examining the house, uh, kind of, um, uh, unearthed or or like um, re kind of like um, represented the like past um, like the past construction there had been like two partitions in the house ma that made it into um, three rooms one a kind of guest room in the front and then um, a living quarters and then something like a kitchen. Um, so what you're seeing here are just the, the projections um, of the past onto the house, but also a kind of rhetorical projection of the path of a shotgun going from the front door to the back door. Um, the house was, um, was kind of conceived as a, um, as a portal for talking about the histories of um, uh, the people who had inhabited this type of house. So the shotgun um, in my research was seen as coming from um, West Africa. And, um, and through that, I, I kind of developed the idea of, of the installation. Um, I think your use of text in is really compelling in silent witness in I think you described it as your like your own artifacts that you made. You like overlay your descriptions of your body in that space over the plan, um, and you begin to fill in the history that's unspoken for otherwise. And in the shotgun house, um, when you begin to project the text onto the window, and then the light comes through the window, and the text is projected into the house. Um, I'm curious as to why you choose to visualize omission um, through text and how you think writing helps you make critical interventions within this like um, silencing or erasure. Okay, so um, I think my use of 
my use of text is related to um, unearthing histories. I, I think there are there are a series of projects um, that I've been working on where um, I'm looking at um, historic narratives um, of um, African Americans for the most part, and and then trying to think about how. Um, you know, these histories which maybe exist as narratives but don't exist in um, what we consider like standard architectural forms. Like one of the problems with architecture is that, you know, as a field, we are heavily invested in objects. And so if there isn't an object, then how do you, how do you kind of, you know, talk about um, a spatial phenomenon. And so I, I sort of focus on spatial phenomenons. And I think um, the use of text in that, um, you know, text is something that you speak, you sound, um, but it also has a body, it's visual. And then um, in my work, it, I've explored like projecting it. So in this project, that's one of the things where the text is projected into the house. The house is, is seen as a kind of landscape or topography of actually a, a plantation landscape where these different fields are um, located within it. So one would be like a field of coming together. Another would be a field of um, warmth, family, love, you know, kind of like the idea of a hearth. Another would be um, a field of um, independence or self-reliance, autonomy. Um, and so in this project, the texts that I used were actually um, slave narratives that were projected into the space. So the idea of like um, in this whitewashed space, a house of darkness, house of light, house of knowledge, you know, and, and its opposite, um, those were things that I was exploring. And the way that text was projected was, um, because the house was white, the text was white on the windows so that it actually wasn't visible in the daytime until the sun started to hit it and then it would project into the space. And the text itself were um, uh, excerpts from slave narratives and um, that, that kind of gave, um, made, made themselves present and gave body to um, <laughs> the speaker in a way, sorry, um, in, in the space. So these are, are like just different um, combinations of the text and the shadow. And in large part, it was influenced by my experience doing the installation um, of like just light, um, kind of this dappled light of trees um, and the kind of atmosphere of the community of houses at Project Row Houses and um, and the, you know, the kids running around and the people and everything. But, but I want to say like in my work, I don't really show people. The, the narrative, um, the narratives are the voices of the people, but I don't show images of people. I, I kind of focus more on um, the effects of the space and to kind of evoke a feeling um, to, to actually engage a viewer um, through their body, like more viscerally as they're um, engaging the space. So the next project is um, the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora and Art, Mokata in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. This was its um, second iteration, very small space, 1600 square feet on a corner, um, kind of corner lot and um, the client had, um, you know, kind of very kind of typical museum desires, flexible gallery space. But one of the things that she wanted was um, a map of Africa in the reception area. And um, the approach that myself and my office took to this was to kind of um, not have a map per se, but to um, build the space of the map. And then that map was not a map of political geographies, um, but it was a map that in a way 
uh, that we thought neutralized the political geometries. So it's a map of time zones um, that in some places you can kind of see the political geography, but, um, but for the most part, it's this insane um, kind of gridding of the globe. Um, and because of its inanity, we thought it was really appropriate um, to use um, for this installation. So it's basically mapping the African diaspora um, and it has a series of, of um, maps um, kind of overlaid on top of each other. And then there's a a like 2D map with a 3D map projected on top of it and the furnishings which one inhabits are the 3D map. Um, I really, I really enjoy this project and your like abstraction of the map into this um, 3D form. Um, and I think it, it makes a lot of sense in that African American identity and like diasporic identity often resist the like, rigid delineations of a map. Um, I think maps have a sort of deceptive neutrality in that they're like inherently an abstraction and then we take them as fact and we make them facts, but they're not literal. Um, and I guess my question is how um, might we engage with the visual authority of a map while understanding how they've been historically used as weapons of imperialism. Um, and I think you begin to do this when you like prioritize the time meridians over um, this political geography. Yeah, so um, I think definitely in this project, um, like one of the goals was to, to get around like the, the the problem of the political um, um, sort of the political mapping of of you know Africa and of the world, um, and and kind of working with the idea of how you know Africa was like the dark continent, and basically it was not mapped until then. It was mapped, but it was mapped in such a way that it was an extension of European nations and it was their property and their resources were their property. And so the, the time meridians are, are actually um, in that vein, but because of their rigid geometry um, and the way that, and it's, you know, it's political as well, but the way that it kind of like um, chops up the globe um, it just seemed kind of appropriate to use this type of mapping. But in, you know, in thinking about maps, um, so my title um, actually comes from um, Benedict Anderson's Imagine Communities, where he has an essay on um, maps, monuments, and museums. Um, and that essay is has been really influential to me to understanding about um, the kind of colonial, um, like appropriation of space, like dividing and appropriation and conquering of space. And so um, I think in my work, I'm not, um, I resist maps. And I think this is, this project is one where the map um, was used in a way that, um, you know, like these different maps of uh, slave routes of um, different migrations. So like transatlantic, sub-Saharan, uh, military migrations, um, like through all these different migrations, forced or not forced, African-Americans, you know, kind of cover the globe. And so the idea of like really showing uh, the diaspora um, in the map, I think was was the the kind of powerful driving force that maybe made it worth it for me to um, <laughs> to work with the map. So um, so anyway, so the book is is 
it shows these projects and and the essay as a project as well. And um, I guess in closing, I wanted to just again invite people to go see Black City, the Los Angeles edition, where I actually do um, explore maps more um, in earnest, but also work with text again. So thank you. Thank you, Toby, for those questions. Thank you. So should we um, at this point, because the structure of the talk was to entertain questions from um, the moderator in the talk, um, I guess we could uh, get questions from the floor if you yes. like. Yeah, so at this time, um, we'll start to open up the chat. Um, if you'd like to um, offer any questions through the chat, you're welcome to. Um, we'll also take questions from the uh, grid of, of the Zoom grid of the audience. Um, if you'd raise your hand um, or uh, have a reaction so that we can know that you are interested. Um, but again, those are our two formats. Um, so yes, questions. Mm -hmm. All right, but uh, I'll start off with a question um, or state more of a statement and positioning of, of for, for questions as people warm up. Um, the, uh, I know one of the reasons that uh, it was imperative to have your work in particular uh, present within the volume was because of its, um, its kind of interrogation of the kind of anti or Un, unexpected monument, right? And this ability for of you to bring out these subtle qualities of the um, monument that is discovered over time um, and, and or that which has been erased slash forgotten over time um, and, and overlooked. And, and then to an, uh, also bring a poetic to it. And so, so similar to your, uh, in, in regards to your shotgun house, um, in particular, where the walls are light, right? And, and thus inverting this idea of how we understand um, separation of space, um, but also connection of space. I think that that, that was an extremely provocative way to start to um, understand what the history of that structure may, may have been but also to project again, a kind of a beauty in something that might be again, mundane at one level. And in some people, not to shotgun house so much, but uh, let's say in reference to the um, plantation in, in Brazil, um, painful, right? So you, you're dealing with these painful and with these kind of mundane spaces. And, um, you know, as you continue to work, I wonder um, how, how do the lessons that you've learned from doing these more subtle projects, more poetic projects, um, how, how it might inform some of the work that you're currently doing at a larger scale um, as you're looking at Los Angeles, the city mapping, as you're looking at, um, as you're doing uh, buildings um, in Japan, things of that nature. Does it inform that work? Um, yes, yes, it does. And, and this work informs that. I think, I don't know, I think that's a question. So your, your, your final question is, is one that, because I have a practice that has a design research component as well as, um, you know, a part where there are clients and um, you know buildings and interiors. Um, are they related to each other? And I think it's actually taken um, you know twenty five years for the um, for the connections to be visible. Sometimes the connections are formal, so you know the lines of light in an installation, um, the way that that um, 
light becomes a wall can then migrate into the way that um, light can become a wall in a, a more normative project. Um, but then also I think um, working in foreign contexts, you know, I have to kind of um, question my subjectivity um, relative to other cultures and, um, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's a very good learning experience. Um, there's one, one experience that I was thinking about today was in um, my first trip in Japan to visit Sendai Media Tech by Toyo Ito. Mm -hmm. um, and this is before um, the tsunami and earthquake. Um, so it was a while ago, but um, visiting that you know, I'm on an architecture tourist, I'm visiting this building and they had a public program where in the public program, there's um, these musicians um, performing. And so one musician is like a rap group, this kind of, you know, pretty famous rap group. And then the next musician that performs is a classical, um, you know, a, a classical musician. And, and so, that really blew my mind, like seeing um, rap and classical music on the same plane, which is something in the US you would never see, but that I saw in Japan. And so experiences like that, um, I think, you know, make one kind of, you know, it's, it's like, you know, like, hell yeah, why not? And, um, and, and it just kind of makes you think differently. And so I think um, like on a personal level, so that's like on a personal level, how it kind of affects the way that I see things and how I approach my work, um, you know, and then from project to project, of course, these things kind of influence each other um, and kind of seep from one, you know, to the, to the next. But I think, um, you know, just thinking about like, my, the installations, like the work that I do and the kind of focus on material um, and effect, affect, um, and how like using um, space and light and, um, you know, duration and presence, these kind of things, um, like how, how that um, has a, a kind of, um, you know, textual quality to it that to me is maybe comparable to um, the narratives that I've been working with. And um, yeah, and so, I don't know, it's something that I kind of muse about, but in LA, what I'm, I'm doing here is um, working more with narratives, narratives of um, black settlement in LA. Um, and that project was shaped by um, just finding these really amazing narratives um, and connections um, that were all place-based. So my rule in doing this work is that it has to be place-based. I'm not just looking at narratives because I'm actually trying to, to get more knowledge about space to kind of spatial histories to, to like unite um, histories of people with the spaces that they dwell. In. And so um, there are these place-based narratives that I um, position within a ghost map on top of the contemporary city, but also the narratives um, are, are kind of like a glossary of terms and places that are all um, of significance to the Black experience in general, this idea of the Black city, but then also to Los Angeles specifically. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, we are nearing um, 7.28. Um, we have more time Yes. for questions. So, Anybody else has a question or I can pose a question. Um, um, 
Well, one thing that really always interested me about your work, Yolanda, is is your the way you've challenged the idea of critical distance in architecture. I know that when I was, you know, the idea that there would be a personal voice in architectural theory or in architectural practice wasn't necessarily encouraged in school. And um, can you describe the way that you began to challenge that idea and what led you to do that in your own studies? Um, so I think like the, my work has greatly been influenced by um, like after graduate school, I applied to the Whitney Independent Study Program um, as an um, art fellow. And while I was there, I wanted to, I wanted to use the art, the studio kind of environment to, um, to like grow an architecture practice that could study issues in architecture. Um, you know, in the way that an artist might, you know, just work on on art. And so um, the Whitney program was actually structured with a series of readings with guest theorists who would come and um, and we would kind of be in a group and we would um, ask questions and kind of talk about the readings. And so um, this practice of um, of like engaging in these uh, theoretical texts and really just um, mm. uh, analyzing them and exploring them um, became part of my own practice that that influenced my writing. So I had been writing before, but more poetry was what I wrote. And then I started to write essays. So it was more about um, and specifically about like representation and women um, and the whole idea of um, black bodies and um, kind of the role of representation. So it started out as um, explorations of representation in part because that's what I was, um, where the work had been done previously, mm -hmm. but I was trying to move it into questions of space and so just always, you know, like, okay, we could start with representation, but what does it mean in terms of space? And so um, that just kind of fed my, my way of working. Mm -hmm. um, and so the notion, I think it was, um, um, so just writing these essays and, you know, trying to you know, trying to be like, you know, proper in terms of, you know, how you approach an essay, but then some of the subjects, it's really, it was, it's almost like, um, I think Marissa in the last talk talked about um, the book Kindred and how, um, you know, there are these kind of multiple subjectivities, one in the present, one in the past, like a, from by Octavia Butler, Kindred by Octavia Butler, where the protagonist in the book is kind of dragged back into um, a kind of slave past. And she's sort of goes back and forth. And each time she comes back, a part of herself is kind of maybe left or changed. And so, um, I don't know, I think in some ways I wanted to deal with this effect of um, the du duality of my experience, you know, that I could read these texts and, you know, kind of interpret theory and abstract and theorize. But at the same time, um, there were these experiences that I felt in a visceral way that weren't being addressed by these texts that would interrupt. Um, and, and so rather than um, pushing it aside, which in my previous education, I had been taught to do at the Whitney program in this context, I, I just kind of let it come through. And so that was really productive, I think, for me. Mm. Thank you. So is it having that space? Kindred is really architectural. I've taught it with uh, architecture students here at Pratt. And uh, people find that um, it's uh, the way um, Butler deals with space and kindred is very useful. And we did a mapping of it to find fractal forms and connected it with African fractals. And saw wow. that the novel itself was 
creating, there were a series of fractals throughout the novel, um, uh, which we found quite useful to that. So, so what you're saying is by incorporating new ideas of representation, challenging what you know about representation to move it to another level where it can be expressive for your own feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a I have a question, Yolanda. Uh, you know, I've heard you describe your work as you know, exploring uh, the spatial spatial effects and techniques of power, and um, some of the examples, right, where you're you're looking at you know the the power of um, the 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 mapping system that might um, you know, obfuscate certain uh, actual conditions. Um, and uh, then you are also, you're talking about uh, your spaces of, of oppression. So I guess what, what, I, what I'm getting to is if that's what you're looking at and your critical practice is focused on, how, how does that then uh, translate into um, your architectural practice, like in terms of trying to flip this power dynamic, you know, aside from the museum that we looked at, is this, um, something that you're actively pursuing uh, in, in the realm of, of your architectural work? Okay, well, I think I have maybe like two ways of answering that. One is, um, is that this, I think I would like to position this as work in architecture, as architectural work, but the way that um, I am, I've been thinking a lot and kind of presenting the work in terms of building and unbuilding. And so like those are two arms of my practice. So one is, is a more reflective practice, more research-based, which is like looking at buildings and cities and, um, and kind of um, in a way seeing them as this uh, kind of spatial topography of um, power with people who are, you know, um, uh, uh, subordinate and people who, who are more in control. And, um, and, and then, and so that's like the unbuilding. So the practice of unbuilding, but it's, it's done in hand with the practice of building which is, is very much like responding to contexts and clients. It's very much responding to contexts um, that are specific and, um, you know, and it's constructing things in the world. I think with the unbuilding work, I'm always building something, right? So there's always a, a kind of physical component to it. So while it's, it's dismantling an aspect of society by looking at an absence. It's also um, it's also constructing, like in um, Silent Witnesses, um, the installation is kind of constructing this uh, space of of like my subjectivity, actually, like the subjective feeling of you know inhabiting or visiting this space in intimate landscapes it's um constructing um this the space of the narratives but but it's also the the idea um of the plantation uh topography and the way that as you experience these narratives so narratives of coming together of stealing away to come together, the risk that's involved. Um, but how, I, I keep thinking of the phrase, like the horror of beauty, right? Like it's something I've thought of a lot and how, um, you know, you're making, I'm making something which has a certain kind of um, beauty to it, but it, it also has a, a certain kind of horror to it. And so the beauty is what kind of draws you in. And then hopefully you find out about the history or, um, you know, whatever the, the absent aspect is. Um, but it does have, you know, either a suppressed nature to it or something which could be conceived of as horrific. Thank you. Um, 
in, in the Mokata project, um, where again you are uh, you, you presented the, that the client wanted a map of Africa um, to to be present within the entry uh, sequence of the project, and and you chose to dematerialize that condition and to also um, kind of break down the understanding of continental borders. Uh, through through time zones and and um, that choice in particular, um, what were your thoughts uh, or, or your reasons for uh, really looking to break down those continental geographic borders uh, in in you know in um, preference for time right as as a way to now somehow maybe bring them more together or I don't know, was it to, I did it isolate, but yes, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so I, I guess the context was that um, in my office, we were, one of our other clients was the Museum for African Art, which is now the Center for Africa. And um, we had done I don't know, something like 13 exhibits for them. Every exhibit of African art had a map um, for the region that uh, the artwork or artifacts came from. And that was because in the United States, we don't really know that much about Africa. So we had to always draw a map. So as part of doing this exhibition production, our office was also producing maps constantly. Um, and so we were used to just like trying to rethink how to represent the map of Africa. And when the client asked for a map of Africa, um, we thought, well, this is the museum of the African diaspora and how can we embody that, you know, more precisely. And that was our goal to capture the map of the African diaspora. And in that process, um, um, you know, it, it ended up being a map more about um, dis disbursement or dispersal, a map about migrations, but also a map that covered the whole globe. Um, and, and I actually like how what you've just uh, explained to us, you know, also starts to work at the kind of uh, material and, and human scale uh, with the separation of, of space between the artifacts, right? And so that they're constructed by, you know, two by four or these wood um, slats. And, and again, a fragmentation, a disconnect within, um, you know, this very material thing, something that we usually understand to be extremely solid, right? Some level of reception desk um, or level of countertop now starts to dematerialize and become fragmented um, and dispersed, as you, you've just uh, mentioned, this uh, map that, you've, that you constructed was also an attempt to do that type of uh, representation of the dispersal of people. Um, I think it's-, it's I, all Could I, before oh, you please, move no. on, I wanted to just comment before you move on to another thought was just how, like, because I think what you just said is really, um, it's a really, in a way, interesting and beautiful thought like how the fragmentation of the wood blocks that the furniture is made out of um you know it does fragment but um where they overlap um they're they're it's extremely durable and strong um so while it's fragmented it's also strong and durable and and then the construction technology was using um, basically Japanese joinery. So there were no nails. Everything was just lap joints and um, dowel connections, but it made something which was, um, you know, that in itself is kind of like diasporic and, and it was just um, um, flexible, but durable and strong, but porous. Um, and it had these kind of contradictions that were, um, you know, very important. Sorry for cutting. Oh, no, 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 that was wonderful. Um, you, you know, because it really does speak to the um, breadth of, of the work and that it's not something that's just, um, 
you know, about the spatial condition, but it does go all the way into the minute detail um, in, in every aspect that you're working with. Um, and again, to think about that your next um, ex exhibition, the one at the MoMA, is going to explore something at the urban scale, right? Um, and, and, you know, have this interplay of narrative that uh, did play out with the, um, the, the uh, shotgun, the Houston Shotgun House uh, project to silence um, that, that this idea of overlaying narrative slash texts um, into spaces seems to be a consistent and um, kind of, of theme that's uh, provocative in, in your work that, that's really coming through. And, and um, also there's this uh, connection to this idea of expanding the idea of um, the at diaspora and making and, and making that present within the projects that you also um, have, have shown here. Uh, the project in Brazil uh, was interesting to hear the history of that project and understanding that uh, you started with uh, looking at uh, United States plantations. And, um, and then, you know, when you took this trip to Brazil, you see that, well, one, you're still in the Americas. And, and, um, and so, you know, to talk about African American is to possibly not just talk about the United States experience, but to possibly talk about an entire, you know, continent and, and um, area and region. And so um, to now say South America, North America, Central America, North America are all America, that there are a series of islands that belong to the Americas. Um, you know, so that too is a kind of micro um, diaspora of, of, of the kind of expansion of, of the African idea. Um, and, you know, and, and so I really enjoy the, that kind of also overlap in this discussion of the a African diaspora. Um, you know, to kind of uh, interrogate the arrogance of us as, as the U.S., saying that we are the Americans and in and, and actuality, America is a lot bigger than just English speaking uh, U.S., um, you, you know, is again a, a fabulous aspect to the kind of breadth of work that you're taking on. Um, Yes. I, again, well, uh, you know, Brazil is the United States of Brazil. So, like, you can't just talk about the United States um, without qualifying which one you're referring to, actually. So. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that I've always appreciated about your work, Yolanda, is the way you, way you make memory so precise in a way and how you move through it and work with it. Um, I was interested to hear today about your uh, genealogy of memory from Alos Regos, uh, unintentional and involuntary memory, two terms that I found really compelling when I heard them, unintentional and involuntary. Um, and. Uh, can you speak to, uh, you know, the use of writing and memory and then drawing and memory and the relationship between the two? Uh, we're working with some students now in a studio where we're, we're introducing ideas of automatic writing and collage as a way to really um, materialize kinds of memories and to be able to understand how they operate. Yeah, um, I think, I think in the in the my most recent work, the um, the Black City Los Angeles edition project, um, like there, I didn't intend to do maps. I actually didn't intend to deal with narratives. I had a totally different project in mind that, in the end, I got to um, in in part of the project that had to do with making a um, kind of mapping. Um, uh, residential segregation, actually. Um, and so these narratives I found as I was researching um, this other subject. But 
the maps, like the approach to the maps um, and thinking about, it's all about memory and, and how, um, like I call them ghost maps because it's like projecting these layers of the past. So maps of the past, projecting them onto the contemporary map. Um, you know, so there are these, they're haunting the contemporary map. So in a sense, I think like with the text and the same thing with drawing in this um, current show is how the, the drawing is haunting um, the city. It's haunting us like we can, we cannot see it, but um, but at times it actually does kind of come to the surface, you know, the past. Um, and and I think like we were sort of conditioned to just kind of, you know, live in the moment or whatever, but the past, the layers of the past are there. Um, and so these drawings are about kind of um, just presenting that, like all of the layers all on top of each other. Um, and so for me, it was, um, it was a departure because like I said, I didn't want to do maps, but it seemed like the best way to represent these places. And, and so the history is actually, um, you know, the history as it's drawn in the maps. And there was one, one site um, in downtown Los Angeles that um, was, so Los Angeles um, was, let's see, I think in um, California became a state in 1850, Los Angeles was actually founded much earlier by the Spaniards um, when they colonized the area. And, um, and downtown Los Angeles was very small and it was basically, it had many immigrants actually in it um, because not that long after it was, um, uh, appropriated by the Americans, gold was, was found. And so then, um, you know, not only were there settlers, but there were also prospectors and the railroads were being built. So it was this kind of somewhat crazy place, but in the middle of this downtown area, there's a street that was called Calle de los Negros by the Californios who were of Mexican kind of mixed race descent. Um, Native American, Mexican um, descent and, um, and African because the Spanish settlers were also from Africa. So it was like mis mixed race people um, as well as Spaniards. Um, and so this street was called Calle de los Negros when um, before the American occupation, after the American occupation, it was called Nigger Alley. And so I was finding maps where the street is called different things. And in some maps, the street, the name is, is not mentioned. And in other maps, the street is actually kind of a race. So it's this um, kind of ambiguous relationship to the street and to the history. Um, the area became um, Chinatown. And so there's actually a historic, um, you know, kind of, tragic race incident where um, like, I think it's something like 17 or 18 um, Chinese men are lynched on the street. Um, and part of that had to do with, you know, just tensions around um, work and uh, race and ethnicity in like Los Angeles at the time. Um, but anyway, so that's like one of the histories that um, I, I sort of uh, focus on in the project. Um, actually, I, I would like to ask a question of uh, Toby, our, our uh, respondent. Um, and, and your, your um, kind of uh, review of the book itself, which uh, you, you did spend a good amount of that review speaking about Yolanda, Yolanda's chapter um, in uh, one of your interests. What was your interest necessarily in her chapter um, as, as a kind of, as a um, writer in an essay and a review of the book? Uh, what was your interest in that work? Um, 
I think I spoke a lot to specifically negative mo monumentalization. Um, and I think that was really interesting to me because I, I was thinking and have been thinking a lot about like absence and erasure and, and like gaps. Um, and I don't think I was ever thinking about it in an architectural sense, but that theory allowed me to think about it in an architectural sense and like this idea that the if space isn't recorded it can actually that lack of recording can gather um like a visceral autonomy and that it speaks even though it's not there um that was um i don't know it I think it was my first com my first confrontation of that kind of discussion within the discipline of architecture. Um, and this idea that narrative can like be complementary to architectural work also mm -hmm. felt new. And that's like things I really want to dig into. Um, and so I think that was why that chapter in particular, and also maps, like in my visual arts work, I'm always working with a map in some way and to see map like made into space, like even the simple act of pulling forward certain parts of the time meridian into like a front desk, um, just learning about different ways you can push against the map and distort it so it begins to be more commonly understood as an abstract um, reading of space. Like it doesn't have to be fact. Like even like if you change the line of a time meridian, there's no actual consequence because it's fake. But, um, but using the fact that people recognize it and take it and like know it to be real in some ways and then playing with that to see how far it can go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Toby, and thank you for your brilliant questions that you posed today. I really appreciated the way the conversation flowed between the between you and Yolanda and the relationship that you've set up together um, as uh, correspondents. Um, and your just one more question for you. Uh, in your architectural studies, do you see yourself pursuing more um, theory and narrative and memory um, and rather than formal architecture uh, designs or, or challenging representation with what you're learning as a way to challenge representation? Um, yeah, I think, I think I tend to be or I'm really interested in architectural theory and sometimes in um, studio, I struggle with like purely formal exercises. I'm like, okay, but what about the ideas? Like, how is this? Or like, why is this formal ex exercise important to me personally? So I do think I like tend towards theory and writing. Um, yeah. Okay, well, and thank you. I mean, I think in, in um, Yolanda's work in particular, um, the thing that I have found and admired the most in, in uh, your work is that um, you have found a way to uh, balance, again, and I'm sure it's a, it's a balancing act, but you found a way to engage both the practice and the theory of um, of the of African American and Af of African diasporic ideas in space, and as we started to get into a little bit in this discussion, um, you know the possi and the possibility of those studies, those investigations, 
um, entering into your current um, wonderful practice that you have right now, international practice, um, you know, is again, uh, inspirational to uh, myself, uh, to I, I think anyone else that is both looking at the uh, individual works that you produce, but also the uh, kind of trajectory of your career thus far. And, and, um, and the way that you engage both gender and um, race identity issues uh, through spatial and material acts, I think, again, has been extremely, um, you know, inspirational. And, and uh, please, please just keep going. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Scott and Jeffrey. Um, I feel really humbled, um, you know, with your wonderful comments today. And thank you, Ashley, so much for, you know, just the three of you for your help, um, you know, for producing this beautiful book. Um, congratulations. Please buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Are there any final questions? All right. Um, something uh, along something just came into the chat. Yes, I can read it uh, from Julia Kaiser. So grateful to learn about this work. I thought you, you mentioned you have used sound and you spoke of the shift from looking at time rather than political geography. Have you used movement and change in your exhibitions? For example, the passage of light passing through the text on the windows that you showed so it shows movement and change in the shadows of space. Are there other examples where you may have introduced movement and change, moving images, et cetera, into the spaces you have worked with? Well, actually, um, like one of, so in, in terms of, I would say like this kind of sensibility, um, I've explored largely in um, architectural works. And then um, what I've been, like ways that I've been looking at um, um, engaging an audience has actually been through um, games and um, you know the idea of like how you can teach someone as they're playing like play as a form of education and I've really been working with that a lot so it's almost like an um, accidental um, kind of um, education um, the way that you could educate people without them knowing they're being educated, without it being very didactic, um, making it, you know, just something that they experience through their, you know, through their mind, but in that way, through their body. I've been looking at that a lot, actually. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there are some compliments coming through on the chat now. So it looks like it's time for us to uh, say goodnight to Yolanda and Toby and everybody else and to welcome everybody back here on March 4th for Rodney Leon's uh, talk with Scott Ruff. Great, thank you, Toby. Thank you, Yolanda, Scott, and Jeff. Have a lovely night. Thank you very much. Yeah, yes. Thank I you. Wish we could all go out for dinner now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next, next